Office of Undergraduate Research Education Theory. Today's presentation is the Introduction to Lab Archives, ELN, and our speaker is Sherry Cusano. This is a virtual event that is being recorded, so we ask you to mute yourself and turn off your camera to ensure the best experience. And if you have questions, please use the chat feature or you can unmute when invited by the speaker. And this is the QR code to our event evaluation. We encourage everyone to fill this out after the presentation, but specifically the Europe scholars must fill this uh, evaluation out to get credit for attending this event. And the mission of the University of Utah Office of Undergraduate Research is to facilitate and promote undergraduate student faculty collaborative research and creative works in all disciplines throughout the University of Utah campus. In recognition that excellence requires diversity, we pursue this mission through equitable programming that promotes diverse and representation and social justice. And we acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous people and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activity. And I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Sherry Cusano from Lab Archives. Thank you, Shelley, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Sherry from Lab Archives. And um, today we'll mainly be going over the Lab Archives ELN for research. But um, I did want to point out Lab Archives has four different products. We have our ELN for research, which um, is what we're going to go over today. We have our ELN for education, which goes hand in hand with the ELN for research. Um, we know a lot of instructors and even students use both the research side and the education side. Um, the classroom side is more kind of equivalent to having a notebook, a course notebook, a lab notebook, and each student gets their own version of that notebook. And so those are the main differences between those. We also have our Lab Archives Scheduler and Lab Archives Inventory. Um, Scheduler is a scheduling tool for resources and inventory is a tool for keeping track of items that are in your lab. And of course, if you have any questions about any of our products, um, I'm happy to go over or show you the other products at the end as well. So what is Lab Archives? Well, Lab Archives is a cloud-based electronic lab notebook platform that you can use to securely store, search, share, and publish your research and data. Lab Archives is cloud-based, which means any device that's connected to the internet can access the platform on Mac, PC, or Android and iOS devices. Lab Archives can also support and integrate with your data management plan. So the idea of a data management plan is that you should be able to account for any data if you were to look back at it in the future in terms of how that data was produced, who produced that data, what the data means, how is it shared, and how is it archived. And of course, if you have any questions on how your existing policy can be supported by all the features of Lab Archives, definitely let me know. To get started using Lab Archives, you will need to create an account. And you can do that by going to mynotebook.labarchives.com. And actually, Utah has single sign-on for Lab Archives. So instead of typing in your email address, you'll just click this sign in through your institution drop down, find the University of Utah, and it'll take you to the Utah page where you can enter your Utah credentials to create your account or log in. Um, so it's not an extra username or password that you have to remember. And of course, if you have any questions on creating your account or any questions at all, definitely um, don't hesitate to reach out to our support team. We have support staff all over the U.S. and even in the U.K. and Australia. So you're guaranteed a pretty prompt reply for your inquiry. We also have an extensive knowledge base and help desk and some webinars um, similar to this one, but for all our products that are weekly and biweekly. Um, we have tons of training videos and quick start guides and other resources as well. And later when I show you the live demo, I'll show you how to access those resources from in-app. 
So typically when using lab archives, you log in, you create or you create your account, you log in, you have access to some notebooks or you create some notebooks and then you can enter your data into those notebooks um, all through the browser. But that's not the only way to enter your data into lab archives. So in lab archives, you can actually add data of any file type and you can enter that data directly from your equipment, email attachments, mobile devices. We also have a ton of integrations. We have integrations with Microsoft Office, GraphPad Prism, SnapGene, um, all types of integrations. So once your data is in your account, it's in our cloud and it's secure and accessible there. It can then also be output in PDF and HTML formats. Now let's talk about access to these notebooks via the four notebook roles. So in Lab Archives, you can have um, one of four roles in every notebook. And just because you're one role in one notebook doesn't mean you're that role for all the other notebooks. Um, you can be an owner in one notebook and a user in another notebook. And so up here you will see um, owner is the highest access role. Each notebook just has one notebook owner, but then that notebook owner can give other individuals access as administrator, user, or guest. Um, and the owner is typically the PI, the director, um, or the project lead. And now down here, you will see that guest is shown in gray because it is the lowest access role. And by default, a guest just has read-only rights. If you do... Um, want to give a guest edit rights, you can change that, give them edit rights, but the notebook does revert back to view only for them after 60 days. And guests are typically external collaborators, interns, sometimes undergraduate students. Now, the next step up from um, guest is the user. So user is actually the most commonly used access role in lab archives. By default, a user will have read and write access to the entire notebook, and users are typically the main bench lab members of the group. Now, the next step up from user is the administrator. So like the user, the administrator has read and write access to the entire notebook by default. But on top of that, the administrator has the ability to share, which means they can add other users and guests to the notebook. Um, and administrators are typically the lab managers or supervisors. Now, most likely when using lab archives, you and your group will have multiple notebooks. The way each notebook is structured is up to you. Each group finds the best structure that works with their workflow. Remember, there's no right or wrong approach. What is important, though, is that everyone in the group kind of discuss with each other, or with your colleagues, how you'd like to organize your data so everyone can stay consistent. Here are a few example approaches. Um, so here we have an individual base notebook structure. So in this approach, each member of the lab gets their own notebook. The, there's still just one owner for all the notebooks. Um, and again, the, the notebook owner is typically the main instructor, the, the head researcher, the PI. Now, there's still one owner for all the notebooks, but the person to whom the notebook is designated for is added as an administrator. That way, that admin can control who has view and edit rights in their notebook. Now, over here is an example of a project-based notebook. This is where you can create one notebook for a specific project that your team is working on. All data for that project can be entered into the notebook, and then each collaborator in the project can be added as a user to this notebook. Also, if there's something that you want your whole group or your whole lab to see, um, maybe like lab policies or SOPs, you can create a notebook just for lab policies and a notebook just for SOPs and add everyone in your lab as a user to it so then they have access. And then, of course, um, you can have a hybrid approach where you have both project-based and individual-based notebooks. And actually, in undergraduate re research, we've seen um, labs use both of these approaches and have worked successfully um, with them. Now, um, I'm going to actually show you the live, um, uh, the live demo now. And here is a notebook that I pre-created for this demo. Um, so I'll give you guys first a little bit of the lay of the land. Um, the center of the screen here, this is the page, and it's essentially your workspace. It's where you can add, um, as you, you'll see as I scroll, it's where you can add text, images, file attachments, all types of data. 
Um, now over here on the left hand side, this is the notebook directory and it's essentially the structure of your notebook. You'll see this is where you'll see the name of the notebook, all the folders and all the subfolders and all the pages that are in this notebook. And if you right click on a page or folder, you'll see some options to copy, rename, delete. Now, nothing's actually ever permanently deleted in lab archives. There's a record of everything. There's a revision history of everything. And that's one of the great perks of using lab archives. Um, there's always that accountability um, and can recover everything. Also on this left-hand side, you can drag and drop folders around to rearrange them however you like. And if you click on a different page, it'll um, show you the, the workspace for that page in the center of the screen. Now up here is a search bar. You can enter something here and then click this magnifying glass to do a simple search. Or you can do an advanced search by clicking this upside down triangle here. It'll show you the advanced search window where you can um, see all the different options to refine your search criteria. Now, um, you'll see here one of the great features of advanced search is the ability to select which notebook to search in. You can search um, the current notebook, all notebooks, or uh, select notebooks. So you're not limited to having your data in multiple, or you're not limited to having your data in one notebook. You can have your data in multiple notebooks and still be able to search through everything. Now to the right of the search box here, you have um, the user icon. If you click this, this is how you can access the user properties. Um, and then to the right of that, we have our notifications icon. And we'll actually go over this a little bit later as well. And now here, this, um, this little eye icon here is our help icon. If you click this, this is actually how you can access that knowledge base I mentioned earlier, the quick start guides, the video tutorials, or even contact our support team. So if you need any help or want to learn more about different features, don't hesitate to use these resources. And this right here is our inventory icon. If you click this, it'll start an inventory lab um, for you. Or if you've already been added to an inventory lab, it'll bring you to that lab. Or if you've been added to multiple labs, you can um, toggle between the labs. Um, and Utah does have the inventory tool as well. And then of course, um, these are some tools here that we'll be going over throughout the demo. Now, um, as you can see here, under this genomics data folder, I pre-added three pages, but let's go ahead and add a page together so I can show you how to add data. Now, I'll go over here. If I want to add a new page under this folder, I'll click this plus new button here and select add new page. And we'll name this November 8th. Oops. This is what a blank page looks like. You can drop some files or create something new. Now, looking up here at the top right corner of the screen, if you click this plus new button right here, you're able to see all the entry types that you can add to this page. Now, I won't um, go over every entry type. So if there is a specific one that you want to see, just let me know. Um, but I will go over some of the most popular entry types. And one of the most popular entry types, of course, is our rich text entry. So if you go to plus new, select rich text, you'll see this little like, rich text window here where you can type up notes or observations or use it to create templates. Really, anytime you want to add text to your notebook, a rich text entry is a great way to do so. And of course, like any text editor, you can change the font, the font size. Um, there's some more text options like strike through, super and subscript. You can change the color. There's paragraph options. Um, you can also embed hyperlinks and embed vi uh, images and videos directly within um, the rich text entry. <clears throat> so now I'll click save to page. And now let's go ahead and add a file. So there's a couple of ways to add files into Lab Archives. Um, one way is just dragging and dropping a file onto the screen. So I'm actually going to just grab a, an Excel document from my other window and I'll drop it right onto the page. And now that Excel document is right there. Um, another way to add an attachment is by going to plus new and selecting attachment. You'll see this prompt where you can drop the files here or click browse files. It'll then let you choose any file from your machine. Um, so I'll go ahead, I'll grab this image document here or this JPEG. 
And so when you're adding attachments, especially if it's an image attachment, we recommend adding a description. Adding a description will add more metadata into your notebook and it'll help improve your search results. So here I'll just put plot results as my description. And then I'll click save to page. Now you'll see there's that JPEG image, the name of um, the image and that description that we provided. And you'll also notice at the top right corner of every entry, there's a timestamp. And this timestamp lets you know the name of the last individual to make any changes to this entry and at exactly what time. This is actually generated by a third party source and you, um, you can't alter it. Also, when you hover over an entry, you'll see this edit entry toolbar um, where clicking the pencil icon will put this entry back in edit mode. Uh, discard those changes. You can also use these arrows to move the entry up or down. There's a comment feature, share feature, and some other features we'll be going over today. So I showed you guys ways to enter files and data directly into your notebook by inputting them directly through the browser. But there are other ways to send files to lab archives, even if you don't have the browser open. So this is possible by using some software specific integrations. Earlier, I know I mentioned we have integrations with Prism, SnapGene, um, but our most popular one is actually our integration with Microsoft Office. So we have a Microsoft Office plugin and a folder monitor tool that you can download. And to access those, just click the triple dot menu, hover over downloads, and you'll see folder monitor or Microsoft Office plugin. Clicking either of these will bring you to the download page where you can download the plugin for Mac or Windows. And now I'll show you a little bit of what the plugin does. So the Microsoft Office plugin, once you download and install that, you can um, open up an Office document on either Excel, Word, or PowerPoint. Um, and even if you're not logged into Lab Archives via the browser, you'll now see that there's a Lab Archives option. And you'll see there's an option to open from Lab Archives or save as to Lab Archives. So typically when using this plugin, you can create an Office document or edit an Office document. And once you're done, you can easily send it to a notebook just click um, save as, a little window will show up where you can choose which notebook, which folder, which page this document will be added to. And then you're done. So the plugin does save you that time of logging in, especially if all you need to do is um, edit or add an Office document. Now, another popular tool we have available to download is our folder monitor tool. So Folder Monitor is a great file upload assistant. So if you need to upload an entire folder of data into Lab Archives, Folder Monitor can help you do that. Um, of course, you can always add an attachment. And when you do it this way, you can add up to 50 attachments at a time. But maybe it's a folder that has more than 50 files in it. Or um, maybe there's a folder structure with lots of subfolders and you want to retain that same organization upon upload to your notebook. Folder Monitor can help you upload that. And anytime you make changes to that folder, whether you make edits to the files already in the folder or add new files to the folder, all those changes are actually synced automatically as long as Folder Monitor is running. And you'll see all those changes are reflected in your notebook. Now, another thing you can do in Lab Archives is add widgets. So widgets are actually customizable interactive HTML forms or applications. We have a bunch of built-in widgets ready for you to use. You can access them by going to plus new, selecting widget. <laughs> and you'll see this little window here um, where this drop-down menu will show you all the widgets we have available to use. Anything with the Lab Archives icon is our built-in widget. Um, and you can also create custom widgets. And if you create a custom widget, the um, that widget will be available to use in any of the notebooks that you own. Um, and so on this page here, I have an example of several built-in widgets, custom widgets, um, because you might want a form that has some interactive elements, maybe some text boxes or check boxes, drop down menus, radio buttons. You can definitely create a widget that has all of these features. 
And um, as you can see, you can get pretty sophisticated with the formatting. If you want to learn more about creating widgets, we have a whole knowledge base section about creating widgets or email our support team. Tell us about the widget you're interested in creating. Um, and we can help you create that as well. Um, and also on the education side, you know, we've seen instructors use widgets for things like rubrics um, or like a calculator or grade calculator. So you can get um, pretty sophisticated with some of the widgets. Now let's go back to that um, November 8th notes page that we created. And now let's talk about editing data. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so on this page, I added a rich text entry, an Excel document, and um, a JPEG image. So remember, you can add data of any file type into Lab Archives, but with some files, you can actually view or edit them directly um, within Lab Archives, and that depends on the type of integrations we have. Um, so even if you don't download that Microsoft Office plugin I mentioned earlier, we have another integration with Office, um, which is the Office Online feature. So that means if you hover over any Office document, you'll see the options to download, view, or edit. If you click edit, it'll open up this document um, in a new tab where you can then make all the edits that you need to make. Uh, multiple individuals can work on this document at the same time. Uh, and all edits are auto saved back with a timestamp of that save. Similarly with images, even if you add one to a rich text entry or an attachment on its own, you can annotate images directly through the browser. Just hover over the image, click this annotate button, and here you'll see it'll open up in a new tab where you can make all the annotations that you need to make. Um, so I'm just going to circle a few things here and you'll see I'm kind of saving a lot and circling a lot just so I can show you that revision history. And I'll make a couple more circles here. We'll save that. So now, um, after I close out of that window or that tab, you'll now see that all those annotations I made are reflected in my notebook. But I can also hover over the notebook, click the triple dots, and select View Revisions. So now you're able to see everything that's been done to this entry. And that's why I saved a lot, just so you can see multiple revisions. Um, and in this um, revision history, you'll see a date and time stamp of exactly when that revision was done, who made that revision. So right now my mock account, John Smith, made all those revisions. But if multiple people worked on this same entry, you would see multiple names here. And you can actually click on a timestamp to see what the entry looked like at that time. So this is before I added the other two circles. Um, this is before we did any annotations at all. And you can even revert back to earlier versions. And now you'll see um, that image is back to the beginning. I can also click the triple dot menu, select delete. <clears throat> it looks like it's been deleted from this page. You no longer see it. But remember, nothing's actually permanently deleted in Lab Archives. Um, so if you click this page tools icon here and select view revisions, you're now able to see all the revisions done to the entire page. You'll see where we deleted that entry and you'll have an option to undelete it and that entry is brought right back along with all the revisions done to it. So if you go back to the revision history, you can see all those circle, the time, the circles that we made or when we reverted back to an earlier version, when we deleted it or undeleted it. Similarly, on this left-hand side, I can right-click this lab meeting notes folder and delete it. It looks like it's been deleted, but if you go over here to the deleted items bucket, you're actually um, able to see everything that was deleted from this left-hand side. You can right-click it and you'll see an option to undelete. And it brings that folder right back to where it was. Um, so now um, let's talk about some collaboration features. So if you collaborate with other researchers or other undergraduate students, you can get each other's attention by commenting or mentioning someone in an entry. So to add a comment to an entry, just hover over the entry, click this comment button here, and this field is where you can type up your comments. And um, you, know, you can say, can you please review this? You can use the at symbol to mention a specific individual. So I'm going to mention my colleague, Jane Doe, and I'll click add comment. <clears throat> 
And so now when Jane Doe logs in, they'll see that they received a notification and they can view their notifications by clicking this bell icon here, or better yet, just go to the triple dot menu and select activity feed. So the activity feed is actually where you can see everything that's going on in your account. So it's a great tool for everyone, especially notebook owners, because they can see what other individuals are doing in their notebooks lately without having to page through the entire notebook. And you'll see all the activities are organized into four categories, and there's some um, further filters to customize the activities shown in your feed. Now, another feature that we have is our linking feature. So you can link a page or entry in a Lab Archives notebook to another page or entry in the notebook or to some external data. And we know a lot of our users, they work with large raw data sets, and those may be stored externally on Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive. And you may not want to migrate all of this information into Lab Archives due to size or policy reasons. So with our linking feature, you don't have to. You can keep your results in Lab Archives and then link out to the raw data. Now, if you want to um, edit or add any links, just click the or hover over the entry, click the triple dot menu, select links. This is where you can edit current links or add new ones. So maybe I want to link this specific um, entry to the SOP that I used. Um, I can then select browse and choose which page or entry to link this to. Or if I want to link out to external data, I'll just click web address here and type up that there. And now after you add links, you will see the links at the top right corner. I just added some mock links to Google and another um, <clears throat> and another uh, heading in this in this notebook. But if you click on one of the links, it does take you to where that link um, should go. Now, another thing you can find at the top right corner are tags. And so tagging is a great way to build a controlled search vocabulary. Um, you can search by tags under advanced search. And when you click on a tag, it'll actually bring all related data um, across all notebooks. Uh, it'll show up. Now, if I click on this PCR analysis tag, it'll bring everything with that tag. All right. And if you want to add or edit new tags, just click the triple dot menu, select tags. Here's where you can edit existing tags or add new tags. And someone actually, um, before we move on, someone asked a great question. Can you embed links directly into the text? You can. Um, so I'll go back to this page that we created just as an example. You just um, will click the pencil icon to put this in edit mode. And all you'd have to do is uh, uh, select the text that you want to embed a link to and then click this insert link button here and then type in the URL for that. And then just click insert. <clears throat> And a lot of people do that as well, instead of um, maybe the linking feature that links to another page or entry, you can also um, click this share button here, grab a URL and copy this and embed that maybe to reference another page as well. So that's another great way to link um, different pages or entries. Now, um, another feature that we have is our page signing feature. So you do have the option to sign a page. You, um, you can do that, but once a page is signed, it's frozen and no data on that page can be added or edited. Um, you may want to freeze a page to protect the intellectual property or it just may be beneficial to your workflow. Um, so here is an example of a signed page you'll see It'll let you know who signed it and it at exactly what day and time it was signed. There's also an option to select a witness. And if I hover over any of these entries, you'll actually see there's no pencil icon, no arrows icon, because once the page has been signed, um, you can't edit it anymore. And then if you want to export your notebook or parts of your notebook, you can definitely generate a PDF or an offline notebook. So to do that, click the triple dot menu, hover over utilities and select create offline notebook or notebook to PDF. Um, and so you can also create a PDF of just an individual page or folder by right clicking um, and selecting PDF. Um, so PDF versions are um, more reader and printer friendly, but with the PDF version, if you have any files in the notebook, those files do show up as um, 
files that link out to the file on links that link out to the file online, excuse me. Um, so if you do want a high fidelity backup there where you can access everything, even without an internet connection, you'll want to create an offline notebook. It'll generate your notebook into a zip archive of HTML files. So it's the best way to get all your lab archives data into your hard drive. All right. And so one of the great features of lab archives, um, you know, there's that collaboration aspect, but also um, sharing with each other um, definitely um, is one of the great features of using this. Um, so it's much easier, obviously, to add someone to your digital notebook than passing um, a physical notebook to a colleague to go over or to check. Um, so if you want to share the entire notebook, you can do that by clicking the triple dot menu and selecting notebook settings. Um, but before I show you some sharing options, just remember um, only two of those four roles I mentioned earlier can actually share. So only the notebook owner or an administrator with sharing rights can share the entire notebook or parts of a notebook, users and guests can't share. So if you are an owner or administrator and you want to share the whole notebook, just go to notebook settings. Um, this first tab here are some simple settings like uh, default for rich text entries or whether or not page signing is allowed. But then if you go over here to the user management page, this is where you can see everyone that has access to this notebook. So by default, when you create the, when you create a notebook, you're the owner by default, and you're the only person with access to this notebook until you add other individuals to it. <clears throat> So I actually pre-added Jane Doe as an administrator in my notebook, but if we want to add a new user, we'll just click plus new user here and just type in um, the email of the individual. So I'll click, I'll type in lab archives user two. And then I'll click add user. So now Jimmy Doe was added as a user to this notebook. It means they have read and write access to the entire notebook by default but they can't share. And of course I can change that. I can give Jimmy Doe administrator privilege. I can change them from user to administrator or even change them from user to guest. Or maybe Jimmy Doe leaves my lab um, and then I can click this trash icon and remove them from the notebook. Um, now, just because you removed someone from the notebook, all the data they recorded or anything they added to the notebook, that still stays in the notebook with a timestamp and their name. Um, it just means that this person won't have access to the notebook anymore. Now, if you don't want to add someone to the entire notebook, you don't have to. You can add someone to just one folder or add someone to just one page or even just one entry. So to add someone to just one page, just click the page tools icon here, select share page. To add someone to just one entry, you can hover over the entry, click this share button here, or maybe you want to share just a folder. I just want to share this lab information folder. I can right click and select share. So all those share buttons I just showed you will produce this share window where you can enter the email address of an individual um, and they are by default added as a guest this way. So if you add someone to just parts of a notebook versus the entire notebook, they're by default added as a guest. Um, and it's nice because then you can control who has view or edit access to all or some parts of your notebook. Of course, you can always upgrade them from guest to user as well. But here, let's go ahead and add another one of my mock colleagues, um, let's see, to this notebook. And we'll add them as a guest. And I'll just, I'll give them edit rights. And I'll say, check out this folder. And now I'll add them. I'll click send. So now that I've added a guest to this notebook, it means that that individual just has access to just this folder. And you'll see there's that icon there. And within the pages of this folder, there are these icons. And within the entries, there are these icons. This lets you know which content was shared with at least one guest. And if you ever wanted to check which content um, each individual can see or which um, folders have who in them. You can always right click, select permissions, and it'll show you go over here to groups or people. 
You'll see Jane Doe, still the administrator of the whole notebook. Jimmy Doe has access to the whole notebook, but Jenny Doe is just a guest with edit access to just this folder. So if I go to a different folder, maybe I'll go to this templates folder and I'll right click and select permissions. You'll see Jenny Doe has no access. But again, you can change that if you wanted to change that, give them view access or go back to notebook settings or the user management tool and change Jenny from guest to user or an administrator as well. All right. Um, that does bring us to the end of our demo today. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Again, if you need any help, just access our knowledge base. It's a great resource for information. You'll see here there's tons of articles. Maybe I want to learn more about widgets. You'll see there's text, there's images. It's a great resource for um, information. And actually, Shelly um, sent over a few questions as well that I'm happy to answer. Let me pull them up. So let me, um, let me answer Jared's question first. Does the group membership actually define any user permissions? So, you know, I actually don't um, use group membership often personally, but it's kind of a way to give one group of individuals the same type of permissions like at one time. So maybe if I want if Jane, Jenny and Jimmy are should only have read only access, I can create a read only group and then add Jane, Jenny and Jimmy to that group. And um, so then that kind of keeps me from having to change them one by one. It'll just give me It'll give them all that access all together, um, if that makes sense. But I know you can, with access or sharing, you can get pretty granular. And a lot of times you may not want Jenny to see this folder, but you want Jimmy to see this folder. Um, and then Hannah said, should we create an account with a personal email or will publications and data be maintained once our you emails have expired? Um, so... This is something I would definitely recommend verifying with your site admin tool team, excuse me, and I can give you some of their email addresses and contacts. I do believe they want you to use your Utah email, um, especially since you're using single sign-on. So with single sign-on, I you won't even really have the choice of creating um, or of typing in your email. It's just whatever email is connected to your Utah credentials is usually what your account is. Um, is created under. And I know a lot of institutions have multiple email addresses or multiple aliases, like it could be at utah.edu or it could be at student.utah.edu. So if you ever had any questions on what email um, was created for you under your account, just go to um, click your name here, go to user properties, and you'll see what email um, was used to create your account. All right. So let's go over some of these questions that you guys asked while registering. Um, what advantage does Lab Archives ELN provide over other software like OneNote? Um, so honestly, OneNote isn't our product, so I'm not as familiar with it. But um, I've heard from colleagues or just other users, you know, with uh, lab archives, you have that revision history. And um, similarly, like the permissions are a lot more granular. So you have a lot more control on who has access to your data and what data they have access to. Um, and there is also that accountability where you'll know exactly when this was added. There's no back tracking or back dating or anything like that. Someone said, is the text within an attachment, example PDF or doc, searchable in the Lab Archives notebook? Um, great question. So to anything that is readable text is searchable. So typically, you know, anything in a Word document, Excel document, that's all readable text. With PDFs, um, it could go either way. So as long as it's a PDF with readable text, then any text in that document is um is searchable um, and it's indexed. Uh, so you might want to double check when you're creating your PDF, PDF especially check like, you know, the OR tool used um, to make sure it's definitely um, searchable. Someone said, in what cases can this technology be applied? Um, you can use it in various ways. And Utah actually has the ELN for education and the ELN for research. So today um, we mainly went over the ELN for research and a lot of it could be, you know, if you're 
lab group does specific research. You can create all the notebooks for the lab um, and it's easy to collaborate, you know, like I showed earlier with the different notebook structures, you can have a notebook for each project. And so instead of each person handwriting everything you have, everyone can just have access to the specific folders or notebooks that they need and then add their data that way. And then you'll have all these features um, and it's always accessible through the cloud. Um, so that's a, um, a good reason to use it. Um, with the education side, uh, typically instructors will make their course notebook and um, they'll use our course manager, which is kind of like a, a wizard, where they'll create their course, add students to the course. And once students are added, they'll actually receive their own individual notebook of um, or their own individual copy of that instructor notebook. So it's kind of the equivalent of an instructor making a lab manual and then making 50 copies of it and handing it out on the first day. But what is great about that is instead of taking home a backpack of full of lab manuals or or packets, um, they can just log in and still be able to see everything that their students are doing. They can see um, as the students work, the students can submit assignments, the instructor can see what they're doing before they submit it, they can give grades. Um, it's nice that it's all digital and in one place. Um, and then what is Lab Archives ELN? We went over that, so hopefully your question was answered. Um, and then someone said, how do I maximize the use of lab archives? Um, that's a good question. There's different ways um, to do that. I mean, one way, of course, is just creating an account, playing around with it. Um, and if you're part of a lab group, um, maybe have someone in your group be the person to um, play around with it, set everything up, set up the notebooks for the lab. Um, we're happy to do individualized training as well um, to kind of help your lab get started or create their notebooks. Um, but yeah, someone just really has to get started using it, set it up. Um, and then you, you know, you can set different policies within your group, maybe saying, you know, this date moving forward, let's do everything digital or let's start entering everything in the lab archives or if you had pdfs or export from a previous tool or you can i know some people scan their paper notebooks if you really really need that in an eln um, you can of course add those as attachments as well um what features of lab archives will help me get the most out of the software um well, we have a lot of features. So definitely um, if whoever wrote that question is here, feel free to elaborate and I can kind of show you all the different tools, but we have a ton of tools that you can use. Um, there's the collaboration tools, the rich text, um, you know, we have the Snap Gene Viewer, Prism uh, integration. We have lots of tools that you can definitely use. Someone just said, I've struggled using the iPad app. Ah, so, um, I'm not sure if you've struggled using Lab Archives on an iPad or actually downloaded the app from the Apple Store. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I don't recommend the app from the Apple Store. It's just an older app. Um, it hasn't been updated recently. Um, and what our developers actually worked on is instead of working on an update to the iOS app, they've actually done like a, a PWA type um progressive web app where um, it's best to use lab archives through a mobile browser. So if you're on your iPad, open up Safari or Chrome for um, iPad and log in that way. And the reasoning for that is the experience is almost identical to doing it on a computer. You'll have almost all the same features. It looks exactly the same. Um, and it's, it's a lot more user friendly. So I definitely recommend um, doing that using the Safari, using Safari or Chrome or Firefox and logging in through a mobile browser over the actual mobile app. I have another question. Figured it's easier to just talk than to use the chat for this one. Um, yeah. So I know that you can, or at least a feature within, within Lab Archives to create and associate a DOI with a, a page or a folder or maybe even a whole notebook. Um, I've, we've tried that just within our lab and sharing it with other people. And it, I don't remember if it was that it said that our, like the site administrator didn't allow that tool mm -hmm. or if it, if for some reason, when we like sent it to say someone's Gmail address or whatever, it wasn't 
you couldn't use it. It seemed like a really useful way to use lab archives as a means to create a public data set mm -hmm. and, and and that you can reference in a paper. And I'm curious if you can comment anything on that, whether we have that feature or or how we have to use that. Yeah, um, and yeah, you, like you said, that's a lot of the usage cases for the DOIs, um, you know, where you want something published. I do see though, University of Utah, your site admins do have it turned off. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't remember their reasoning for having this feature turned off. Um, but that's most likely why you couldn't create that DOI just because it's not turned on for your site. If you'd like, I'm happy to um, give you the emails of the site admins. You can ask them a little bit more about that. Um, and a lot of times with site admins, sometimes they keep something off until they realize, oh, hey, someone actually wants to use this or I'm getting a lot of people tell me this would be helpful for their use. Um, and then they turn it on. So it's a quick switch of a button on their end and or on our end. We just need their permission to turn it on. Um, but I'm actually going to give you their contacts here. I'll put it in the chat. Um, so that is a good question. So if you ever have any, you know, policy questions on like, what can we put in the lab archives um, or what should we put in or why don't we have this specific feature, even though I see that lab archives offers it, um, I definitely recommend reaching out to the site admins to let them know you might be interested in that feature or to get the reasoning on why it's not turned on. Yeah, and Richard put in some information there about the classroom side um, as well, because we know a lot of the students on this call probably work on both the classroom side and the research side. Um, and so it could benefit you to use both products. Well, I do have um, a couple last slides. Um, Shelly, if you want to close out the, mm -hmm. the webinar, um, thank you everyone yeah. for letting us join in and show you our great product. Um, definitely don't hesitate to reach out if you guys have any questions. Thank you much, so much, Sherry, for today's um, presentation and demonstration. I'm sure it helped all our students and they can ask their um, mentors, PIs, if they have more questions. Uh, I just want to remind everybody about the event evaluation. Here's the QR code and I just dropped the link in the chat. Um, reminder that Europe scholars must fill out this evaluation in order to receive credit for the event. And just a reminder, the Office of Undergraduate Research, we're located in the SEAL Center. Um, our web address is our.utah.edu, and you can email us at our.utah.edu. And thank you again, Sherry, and Lab Archives.